that may go through the flood and the fire and yet you are going to preserve the church we pray that you will preserve your church you preserve the members and the ministers and the pastors and the preachers and the overseers and the workers in the church as well in Jesus name preserve us Lord in the book of life preserve us in your service and preserve us with the anointing that's able to overcome every challenge we have in life in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, as the world and the devil and the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church, will not prevail against the church, every member of the church and every worker here present to Lord, the gates of hell will not prevail against us in Jesus' name. Grant your people real backbone real conviction real courage and real power spiritual strength that we will do everything you have called us to do that this church you are building this church will stand we well, thank you because we know you have answered in jesus name we pray as you know and as i've told you already we're going through a series a series of studies on the church that is the church in the book of revelation chapters 2 and 3 the series will include a fundamental church in a pluralistic world number two a fearless church in a persecuting world number three a faltering church in a perverted world Number four, a feeble church in a putrefying world. Number five, a formal church in a perishing world. Number six, a faithful church in a pessimistic world. Number seven, a flattered church in a permissive world. And I pray that as we go through all this, the challenge we receive, the unction we receive, the anointing we receive, the power we receive, the conviction that is rebuilt again in our lives will make every one of us overcome us in Jesus' name. And then we'll conclude with the overcomers in the promised eternal world. Now we come to the session for a fearless church in a persecuting world we're looking in at revelation chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 8 revelation chapter 2 verse 8 and unto the angel of the church in smyrna write these things says the first and the last which was which was dead and is alive i know thy works and tribulation and poverty but our treach and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and they are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, tested, and ye shall have tribulation, trial, and persecution ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. We're talking about a fearless church in a persecuting world. Again, as you come to verse 8, it says, Unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, write. We need to emphasize once again that this angel is not an angel in heaven. It's the leader of the church. It's the minister in the church. It's the pastor in the church. It's the shepherd of that church. It's the overseer of the church is the teacher the appointed teacher in the church how is it when it says an angel we can apply that to 
a man, a minister, a preacher, a pastor, a shepherd, an overseer. Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 14. And my temptation, which was in my flesh, ye despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Because you know that I stand for Christ, I represent Christ. He is the one that appointed me, ordained me, and he sent me to preach his word unto you. And if he were here, this is exactly what he will be telling you. The challenge he will be giving you. And the same challenge I bring to you as a representative of receive me as Christ Jesus, in fact, as an angel of God. I as an angel of God. What the leader, the pastor, the minister, the worker, is referred to as an angel of God. Verse 20 of Psalm 103. Psalm 103. I'm reading from verse 20 here. Then we'll go on to verse 21. Bless the Lord, ye his angels. That excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, verse 21, all ye, ye ministers of hate that do his pleasure. Join those two things together. In verse 20, the angels that excel, excel in strength doing his commandments. Verse 21, the ministers doing his pleasure. Because the ministers are supposed to do the pleasure of the Lord. Fulfill the will of God. Obey the commandments of God that the angels do. Angels do it in heaven. We do it here on earth. That's why, why we're here on earth, we're referred to as the angel of the church. The church in the house is the house family. The leader there is to extend his strength and is to do the commandments of the Lord like an angel of God to that house fellowship. And the zone, the area, the district, the leader there is supposed to carry out the will of God promptly like angels do. And without any question, like angels do, obediently, like the angels do, the leader there in the zone, in the district, in the village church, in the local church, in the region, in the state, is to carry out the mind of God and the will of God, like the angels do, without any question. That's why it says, you are the angel of the church in Smyrna, if you happen to be in Smyrna. And then we're to carry out that will of God without any interruption. Day after day and year after year, we keep on carrying out the will of God. The women lead out there. You are the angel. Over those women, you live an angelic life, angelic appearance, angelic conversation, angelic strength. Angelic obedience from day to day, like the angels do. Come back to Revelation chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, it talks about the church. What's the church? The people who are called out, they are out of the world, they are in the kingdom, in the Lord, but there's something, there's an activity they carry on in that church in that ecclesia, in that congregation. I'm looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11. Acts, chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 26. Acts 11, verse 26. It says in verse 26, And when he had found him, that is, Barnabas finding Saul, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. The church is an assembly. 
the gathering, the congregation assembled themselves with the church. And it says in that verse 26, and they taught much people. They taught much people. The church is the assembly of people who are taught in the words of the gospel. They are taught in the knowledge of the kingdom. They are taught the responsibilities of children of God. And it says, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. They resemble Christ. The teaching of the angel of the church transformed them. And they became like little Christ. A lady Christ there. A boy Christ there. A girl Christ there. A young man cries there, and because of the little, little cries and little cries, they talk like Christ, they live like Christ, they behave like Christ, they pray like Christ, and they comport their lives like Christ. And because of, they are called Christians in Antioch for the first time, they were disciples of the Lord. And already we now know that there are true disciples. And those true disciples, they are the people who have decided for the Lord. They are people who are instructed in the things of the Lord. They are saved and they are sanctified and they are living a saintly life. They are the people that are committed and consecrated unto the Lord. They are the people that are industrious. They are working for the Lord. They are the people that are pure and holy and righteous. They are the people that are loving and the people that are evangelize and enduring unto them. Those disciples were called Christians, first in Antioch. And it tells us here that is the church. Assembly of saints. Assembly of disciples. Assembly of the people who are taught and transformed and trained to do the will of God. We're talking about a fearless church. And we're talking about that church in a persecuting world. The world in which we live is not a kind of, it's not a world that is friendly. That's why, even though it is not a world that is friendly, this church in the book of Revelation is built on the rock. And it's got a firm foundation. The foundation of that church is Christ. That's why Christ came to the church and he says, he's walking about in the church. That church has been through the flood. That church has been through the fire. But one of these days, the church that has gone through fire and flood is moving up higher. You'll be among those who will move up higher in Jesus' name. Is the church triumphant? Today is the church militant. But tomorrow is going to be the church triumphant. And it says it is built by the hand of the Lord himself. Yes, it's in the world, but then it's having victory. And this victory will be yours in Jesus' name. We're looking at John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 18. John chapter 15, verse 18. The world in which this church is built. The world in which this church is existing. In John chapter 15, reading from verse 18. If the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love its own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. It's a persecuting world. Welcome back to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 8. And unto the, unto the angel of the church in Smyrna. That word Smyrna actually is the name of the city in which they were. And the name Smyrna actually reflects even the situation, the condition of the church there. The word Smyrna is like when you put uh, something in between two platforms, two, uh, two wooden platforms. And then you press those uh, two wooden things together and you compress the thing that is inside. Pressure was coming from the world. Pressure was coming from every direction upon this upon this church. It's like they were going to smash them, smash them. They were going 
going to compress them in Smyrna and they were going to crush life out of them. And even though the persecution was there, the pressure was there, they, even though the fire was burning, but the church was still going stronger and stronger. This church will keep on growing stronger and stronger in Jesus' name. By the way, why were those, the church in Smyrna in particular, why was it so much persecuted? You need to understand that in those days, there was an emperor named Caesar. And that emperor Caesar now raised up himself like a god. And that's what all those emperors have always done, starting from the time of Egypt. Pharaoh uh, counted himself like a god. And that's why he said, who is that other god that told the children of Israel, let them go. I don't know any other god. He was god over there. Nebuchadnezzar raised up himself and he acted like a god. That's why he set up an image. They should worship him. And when Caesar came, he followed after the pattern of the emperors before him. And he also raised himself up like a god. And, and then they expected and they demanded that everybody in Smyrna will go to a big shrine, a huge shrine in Smyrna, and they will go and worship Caesar. And when they go to worship Caesar, they give them a certificate. They have done their duty for that year because they offer a pinch of incense unto the idol representing Caesar. But these Christians, they said, we know only one king. Only one God and him alone we're going to serve. Our King is Christ. Our Lord is Christ. Our Master is Christ. Our Redeemer is Christ. Our Sovereign is Christ. And the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, he is Christ. He is the only one we're going to worship. And that was the reason why persecution came upon them heavily. Three things. Number one, that why the persecution came. Number one is the rejection of the worship of Caesar. The rejection of the worship of Caesar. And if you were living in Smyrna and you declared that you were a Christian, a believer in Christ, a convert to Christ, a disciple of Christ, a follower of Christ, a person that is surrendered, fully surrendered to Christ, there is one stand you are going to take. Number one, rejection of the worship of Caesar. That's going to bring persecution. Number two, is the worship of the, it's the renunciation, renunciation of the worship of any creature, any creature, any creature. And when you reject, when you renounce, when you kick away, when you take away from your life, you renounce the worship of any creature that is going to make you face persecution. Look at Revelation chapter 1 verse 25. Revelation chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 25. And so you will see why they went through persecution. And when you come to such a situation today, that you reject, number one, the worship of Caesar. Number two, you renounce the worship of any creature. Persecution might come, but like the church in Smyrna stood, you're going to stand in Jesus' name. Revelation Romans chapter 1 verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator. Worshipped and served the creature more than the creator. I'm sure that you've read in the, on the pages of our newspapers. In politics, that's what they call Godfather, Godmother. That is, all those people in politics, they need to listen to the Godfather. And it's actually the Godfather that is pulling the string, that is dictating what they do and what they don't do. But uh, it's something you'll find in those days, in religion, there were the Godfathers and the Godmothers. And the preachers were not, those preachers who were compromising, they were not free. Strings were attached to them by Godfathers and Godmothers, Godmommies. That whatever they wanted was what those preachers preach. But when you come to understand that Christ is the Redeemer, Christ is the Savior, Christ is the Lord, Christ is the King of Kings, and Him and Him only, are you going to worship your life? Number one, there's going to be the rejection of the worship of Caesar. Number two, there's going to be the renunciation 
of the worship of the creature of any man in the church or outside the church any woman in the church or outside the church number three now is the restriction to the worship of christ restriction to the worship of christ you're saying him and him alone him and him only will i serve and Caesar will not bear that. And those creatures, those mommies and daddies that want to be worshipped, they will not bear that. They want you to, you can worship your Jesus, but worship me too. You can worship your Jesus, but bend to meet you. You can worship your Jesus, but bow to meet you. And when you say you are restricted to only the worship of Christ, those who do not love that who want to compete with Christ, they're going to persecute you. And that's the reason why the church is manner was persecuted from all directions. But the student, we're going to stand. I said, we're going to stand. You go to your place of work, you walk over there, you love your employment, you love your employer, but you don't worship them. And when they say anything that contradicts the word of the Lord, that contradicts the principle of righteousness, that's where you draw the line. You are there so that you can have some material things to, to feed your body. They don't have any authority over your soul, over your spirit. And when they want to control not just your body, not just your time they want to control your conviction they want to control your heart they want to control your spirit that's where you draw the line there is restriction to the worship of christ and christ alone that's the reason this the church became a fearless church in a persecuting world three points we're going to concern number one proclamation by christ the first and the last proclamation by Christ, the first and the last. Number two, the persecution of Christ's faithful followers. The persecution of Christ's faithful followers. Number three now is the promise from Christ to the fearless and the faithful. The promise from Christ to the fearless and the faithful. We come to number one, proclamation by Christ. The first and the last. We're coming to Revelation chapter 2 verse 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, right. This thing says the first and the last, which was, which was dead and is alive. Immediately this epistle, this letter was read in the church at Smyrna. They recognized immediately who was writing to them. Although John was used as the penman, but Christ is the real author because he says, I'm the first, I'm the last. Not only that, he's the one that was dead, but now is alive. Let's come back to chapter 1 of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1 verse 11, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. That you'll find is the very introduction of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is Christ. The risen one. This is Christ. The glorified one. This is Christ. The cornerstone of the church. This is Christ. The redeemer. The savior. The sanctifier. This is Christ. The one at the right hand of majesty on high. Look at verse 12. And I turn to see the voice that, that spake with me. Being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks under the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. One like unto the son of man. Clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about with palms with a golden girdle and then his head is as his head and his uh, ears it says were well, white like wool and then it says and as white as snow and his eyes were well, like a flame of fire and his feet like unto the fine brass as if they were born in the furnace and his voice as the sound of many waters and then it says he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his uh, out of his mouth went a sharp sword and a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was as the sun that shineth in a strain and when i saw him i fell at his feet as dead and he laid his right hand upon me saying unto me fear not i am the first and the last 
I am the first. This is Christ. I am Alpha and Omega. I'm the first and the last. I'm the beginning and the end. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And everybody said, Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Christ presents himself here. He introduces himself to the, to the angel of the church, to the messenger, to the pastor, to the overseer of that church at the very beginning of his message to the church. And the titles used for Christ are taken from this chapter 1. I've read that to you already. And they are appropriate to the state and the need of the church. He is the living Savior. He is the living Lord. As he had himself triumphed over death and over suffering and over the grave, so he said that the people were also going to be triumphant and they were going to uh, succeed. I was dead. I am alive. I'm a living and then because of what he said to the church I'm giving you he goes from the deathless past onto the deathless future it's deity he is the lasting one but he is the living one too the living one too that shows his humanity that shows his humanity that he, he came to this world he was born of a virgin he lived a sinless life and then eventually was crucified because he's the son of man and then on the Sunday he rose again he said I am the living one I was dead but I'm alive again that shows his humanity and then he's the loving one it's for the church it's for the church I know your works I know what you're going through I know your poverty I know your persecution I know the the profanity of the people against you but i'm staying by you i'm standing by you that shows the loving one that shows is sympathy is sympathy number one is deity number two is humanity number three is sympathy and see what the lord is saying he said he was dead and is alive again this that once identifies him to the people in his manner as the lord jesus christ for to no one else could they supply. He had been put to death and he had risen from the dead, from the grave. Now he's alive forevermore. Your Lord is alive forevermore. Your Savior is alive forevermore. Your Redeemer is alive for, forevermore. And whatever flood of fire you may go through, it will sustain you to the very end. In Jesus' name, it will always sustain you. In any persecution, in any problem, in any suffering, it will see to it that your trials will fulfill their purpose. What's the purpose of the trial? Why would Jesus Christ allow the people to go through any suffering like this? Number one, the purpose of the trial is purging. It's purging. He allows the trial to burn out all the kind of uh, things now the chaff in our lives that are not supposed to be there number one is purge number two is purity to purify us when you put a uh, gold through the fire it purifies that gold it purifies that gold and when the lord allows the flood to come it washes away all those dirty things and then the fire to burn it burns away all the chaff number three is patience our trials teach us patience Patience with people, patience with problem, and patience with a peculiar situation. It teaches us patience. It teaches you to us perseverance. Perseverance that you know every trial makes you strong. It strengthens your backbone. It strengthens your resolve. It strengthens your commitment. It strengthens your courage. How do you develop courage with no problem, no trial, no persecution, no opposition? How do you, de how do you develop courage? How do you strengthen your conviction? Those uh, persecutions are allowed to come to purge us, to purify us, and to lead us to patience and perseverance. It's to give us power. You see all those persecutions coming? It's to give us power. Don't you see the wind blowing when the wind is blowing? It strengthens the trunk of that tree. And when the wind is blowing against our lives, it strengthens us. It makes you to plant your feet on the rock of ages so that you will not move. It also leads us to prayerfulness. You see, when persecution comes, we run to the Lord. We go to the Lord. We say, oh Lord, I have this need. Help me to stand. I have, the, I have Canaan land before me. I have the promised land before me. I have paradise before me. I have heaven before me. Help me stand. The persecutions, they lead us and they drive us to prayer. 
persecution also help us for preparedness for the coming of the Lord we're preparing for the coming of the Lord and so are the persecution is coming it makes us to prepare more and prepare more oh Lord I've gone all these five years in the Christian faith all these 17 years in the Christian faith I don't want to backslide all this persecution is coming so as to drive me back make me to stand on the rock of ages so that I will not fall and you will not fall in Jesus name that leads me to point number two the persecution of Christ's faithful followers the persecution of Christ's faithful followers to start with you understand is the faithful who are persecuted the worldly will not be persecuted the sinful will not be persecuted the people that try to use the wisdom of the world to look like the world and dress like the world and think like the world and plan like the world and walk along with the world and agree with the world they'll not be persecuted if you are the only christian in your family and the other people are just churchgoers if you are compromising with them if you're doing what they expect you to do, you say, yes, you go to your deeper life church, but when it comes to family decision, this is what we all decide. And you must always toe the line. If you're always like that, who is going to persecute you? You're part of them. You're part of the world. The world will love its own. They will love you. Anytime they're going to do their kind of adulterous ceremony, they'll call you. They say, she's always there. He is always there. You're always in agreement with them. It is when you draw the line. It is when you say, this far and no further and then you stand you take your stand that's when the persecution is going to come because you're a faithful follower of the lord jesus christ i pray you'll be like the church in smana in jesus name come to chapter 2 chapter 2 of revelation i'm reading from verse 9 i know thy works i know thy works do you know that jesus christ has all knowledge all knowledge he knows everything we, we don't have to report to him and we don't have to explain to him and we cannot hide anything from him he knows he knows in the dark he knows in the day he knows in the night he knows in the light he knows every time and everything and he knows everybody i know thy works they begin to hide Itemize, itemize the things he knows about the church in Smyrna, the people in Smyrna. He says, I know thy works. Number one, the tribulation. Number two, thy poverty. Number three, it says, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Three things that he said, I know about you. Number one, he knew their persecution. Tribulation is persecution there, their trials. The persecution, the suffering, the opposition, the pressure to crush them, and the opposition they had to make them get discouraged, and the fight against them to make them discouraged and turn away from following after the Lord. I know, and you sum up everything, I know your persecution. Number two, I know your poverty. The word poverty here in the original Greek means penury, almost living from hand to mouth, living from God's hand to mouth. That you need to depend upon the Lord every time because you don't know where any other thing will come from. Why were they poor? I thought because they were faithful, they shouldn't be poor. You know, some churches tell us today, if you're poor, that means that there's something wrong with you. If you're poor, that means that you're not a real child of God. They say the mark of their own Christianity is that you're rich and wealthy. Is that you have everything and you have surplus. That that is the reason, that is the evidence that you are a real Christian. But Jesus Christ here, he had no correction, he had no condemnation, he had no rebuke for the church in manner. And yet he says, I know your poverty. Why were they poor? Because you know, they had their guilds that you know, the unions, the labor unions. If you are a tailor, there was a lady or a tailor's union, the guild. If you were a nurse, there was the nurses union, a guild. If you were mechanical, you know, you're working with your hand, there was a guild all to that too. And for you to be able to get jobs and for you to be able to get anything, number one, with the government that is under the leadership of Caesar, you will show your certificate. It's almost like your tax clearance before you can get a job. You've gone to the shrine and you have offered your pinch of incense unto Caesar as the Lord, as the King, as the all in all, as the owner of your life, as the one that possesses you. 
And when you offer that pinch of incense, then you will come back to offer that to show that I've been there and I've, I've accepted a Caesar as my king. But the Christians will not do that. And because the Christians will not do that, they took their stand. They will not have the certificate. They will not offer a pinch of incense unto Caesar. And because they had nothing to show that they were serving Caesar, that's why some jobs eluded them. We're told that Smyrna was a very rich community. But because these people will not serve the gods of the land, and they will not serve the man in the land, and they had only to serve the God who is in heaven. That's why it says, I know your poverty, your penury. Number one, your persecution. Number two, your poverty, your penury. And then it says, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, the profanity, the profanity. They were blaspheming these people. They were saying that they were doing, uh, you know, terrible things. And they were accusing them of a, kind of a kind of life that was not theirs. There was no popularity at all in the world. The profanity, the, the blasphemy of them will say they are Jews and they're not. But they're the very synagogue of Satan. You see, this is the temple of God, the church. That's the synagogue of Satan, all those Jewish people. And then the synagogue of Satan was opposing the church and the temple of the living God. That's why the persecution was there. And Lord begins by saying, I know, I know, I know, I know thy works, implying the most intimate acquaintance with all that pertains to the church. And he knows your works too. He knows what you are going through. Are you under pressure? He knows. Are you under persecution? He knows. Are you going through some narrow path and it's becoming difficult for you to pass? He knows. Are you, are you hedged in? You know, there is a family on the one side and there is, a, you know, employers on the other side and there are neighbors on the other side and all this, they are trying to press you in and to crush you until you don't have any breath anymore, until you don't have any, co any courage anymore, until you are totally pressed out of measure. He says, I know. I know, I know. And yet in that knowledge, it says I can supply your strength as your days are. So will your strength be. As your persecutions increase, then the power, the, the, the sustaining power will increase as well. Underneath you will be the everlasting arms in Jesus' name. He said, I know your pressure, I know your poverty, I know that almost destitute, having nothing. But the Lord is saying that he's going to be with you, he'll be with you to the very end in Jesus' name. Well, three things, what are the, what's the reason for all this position? Number one, the purpose of persecution. Number one, the purpose of the persecution. Number two, is the period of the persecution. And then number three, is the price of the, for the persecuted. The price for the persecuted. Number one, is the purpose of the persecution. Why would loving Christ allow the people of God to be persecuted like that? You know, the Lord will not, uh, will not allow anything without a good reason. A persecuted church will normally have sincere members, faithful members, truthful members, people that are really committed to the truth. You see, when you are not committed to the truth, you can join any church. But you don't want to suffer for something you don't really believe to the very depth of your heart. And the Lord allowed the persecution so that the people that are real will come out. And then those that are fake and counterfeit, they will find their way. Persecution will normally sift the church, purge the church, and take away from the church the people that are not really standing. And thank God that you are standing. I say thank God for you are standing will keep on standing in Jesus name the purpose is to purge is to purify the purpose is to teach us patience the purpose is to lead us to preparedness the purpose is to make us prayerful the purpose is to make us persevere the purpose is to strengthen our spiritual muscles and make us powerful number two is a period of the persecution the period of the persecution look at verse 10 Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Be behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, and ye shall uh, and ye shall be cast into prison, and ye, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation, trial, persecution. How many days? How many days? Ten days. Let's breathe. Ten out of three sixty-five is very small. The Lord is telling us in comparison with eternity. 
your persecution is like 10 days out of 365 days. You can bear that. You can easily count. You have 365 days ahead of you. And then 10 of those days, negligible. You can manage that. It says 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. It's all over. Only 10 days out of 365. And it's saying the period of persecution in comparison with eternity is very small. It's negligible. And therefore go through and don't allow these 10 days negligible and very small infinitesimal. In comparison with eternity, don't allow that to hinder you from enjoying all the privileges of the people of God in eternity. And then the prize, that is P-R-I-Z-E, the prize for the persecuted, the reward for the persecuted. It says in that verse 10, in that verse 10, and I will give you, be faithful, be thou faithful unto them and I will give you a crown of life. That crown of life, you will not miss it in Jesus' name. I'm looking at Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, he told us before, there's going to be persecution. He told us before, the pressure will be there and the pressure may come from within, may come from without, may come from the people that are close to you. In fact, how can people persecute you if they're not close to you? How can people persecute you if they're not near unto you? The persecution Persecution will come through people that are close to you, but you'll be faithful till death in Jesus' name. Matthew chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 16. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Behold, I send you forth a sheep in the midst of wolves. Be, be ye therefore wise as serpents, not worldly wisdom, this is the wisdom of God, wise as serpents and harmless as those, but beware of men. For they will deliver you up to the, to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, and ye shall be brought before the governors and before kings for my name's sake, and for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak. For it shall be given you in that hour what ye shall speak. Say amen to that. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. The Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. The Spirit of God will empower you. It will energize you. It will establish and you will stand. And no persecution will put your back to the wall in Jesus' name. Verse 21, and the brother shall deliver of the brother to death. The brother, uh, you know, fanatical of religion, will deliver up his brother who has submitted to Christ unto death. I'm telling you, it's the people who are close to you, the people who are intimate with you, and they do not agree with your conviction. They do not agree with the surrender of your life, totality of your life, unto the Lordship of Jesus Christ. They are the people that are going to persecute. And then it says in verse 21, And the father, the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Think about that. The children, they do not have any agreement with what you stand for. They might even surrender you to severe persecution. And it says, And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure to the end, he that shall endure to the end in the midst of persecution, he that shall endure to the end in the midst of trial, he that shall endure to the end in the midst of all those, the fire and the flood coming against your life, he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. The same shall be saved. When it says, he that shall endure to the end, where are those people that will endure to the end? You say it with your mouth, I will endure to the end. I said I will endure to the end. Make a commitment before the Lord, I will endure to the end. You will be saved finally in Jesus' name. But you know, what we go through here is a temporary fire like the fire of 
of Nebuchadnezzar and shake them be shark and Abednego. They went in and they came out. But as a kind of fire going to burn our persecutors, they will go into that fire, they'll never come out. And when they are burning forever and forever, you'll be worshiping the Almighty God in joy everlasting in Jesus' name. And so you see what the Lord is telling us. Says, persevere. He says, persevere. Don't mind what they say or what they do. The Lord Himself, He will be with you in Jesus' name. I'm looking at uh, Hebrews. I'm looking at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I will see what He wants us to do. He wants us to endure to the very end. To the very end. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 32. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. But call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated ye endured a great fight of affliction he endured a great fight of affliction. It's not going to be a kind of puny sin, a kind of negligible sin, a kind of small sin. It says it's a great fight of affliction partly whilst ye were made against his talk by bo both by reproaches and affliction. You know, sometimes it's not that they beat you. It's just words, corrosive words, acidic words. I was the born like acid. Words that are terrible to reproach you, to insult you, to insinuate that you're not just following the Lord, you're following your own, whatever it is, you're following. After all, all those synagogues of Satan, they did not know the commandments of the Lord unto these disciples. And so they reproached them, they abused them, they insulted them, and, and they heaped a lot of words against them. And those Israeli bought, and it says, and partly, while ye became companions of them that are so used that he is, let's say your father is a real Christian and is going through a real persecution and you are companions like that. Your husband is a real Christian and he's being persecuted and your wife, you have to stay by him. Companions. Or maybe your wife is going through a persecution because she's not going to follow all the commandments of the people in the place of work. It's not going to follow their dress code. It's not going to follow their ceremony. It's not going to follow all the things they want. She's not not going to give herself to the manager to the director so that she'll be in good terms with the director and because of that there's persecution and while she's being persecuted you are standing by her you are a companion of those who are being persecuted in verse 34 for ye had com compassion on me in my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods the spoiling of your goods sometimes there's even the spoiling of your material possession but you say it doesn't matter. I have a greater inheritance in heaven. I have a greater material sin or spiritual sin, eternal sin in heaven. And therefore, whatever they do to what you possess here on earth is not, it does not bother you at all. And then he goes on to say, knowing that in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. It says then, because of what you know, look at verse 35, cast not away therefore your confidence which has great recompense of reward. Cast not away your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. I pray you'll endure to the very end in Jesus' name. It says in verse, in verse 30, it says, For ye have need of patience, of perseverance, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. You'll do the will of God. And you will receive the promise finally in Jesus' name. For yet a little while, for yet a little while, only 10 days out of 365, for yet a little while, it's, it's, it's uh, negligible, the time of persecution, the period of persecution, for yet a little while, he that shall come will come, and will not tarry, now the just shall lay by faith, but if any man draw back. If any woman draw back, if any believer draws back, if any minister draws back, and if any, any overseer draw back, if any, any preacher, any pastor, if he draw back, it's too much for me. The heat is too much. I think I'll have to succumb. The, the persecution is too much. I think I will have to yield. You will not yield. You will not surrender your soul to the persecutor in Jesus' name. You know what the word Caesar is fighting for? Caesar is fighting for your soul. Worship me, don't worship Christ. Caesar is fighting for your spirit, is fighting for your destiny, is fighting, is, is fighting for your eternity. And he's saying, Give yourself to me. 
withdraw from Christ. Don't be so committed to Christ, so, com so consecrated to Christ, and don't be so yielded and, and surrendered to him. I want to provide total ownership of you. And when anyone says, that's another Caesar, that's another Caesar. Maybe it's your parents. I want to have total ownership of you. Don't give your life to Christ. Don't give your all to Christ. If you give yourself to Christ, I don't do it partially, but give me the very nucleus and the very center of the conviction of the totality of your life. Maybe your husband may say that to you as a wife, that you are committed to this salvation. It's eternity. It's eternity. And because this is your destiny, that's why you are taking your stand. Or maybe it's your wife that wants to demand. He says, if you love me, give me your heart your whole heart and all this commitment to the word of God and commitment to the Lord losing all that, give up all that and give yourself to me let me know that I possess you if you're a real lost man going to heaven say no madam, you're not going to possess me Christ possesses me there is marriage and then there is heaven and this heaven, you're going to get there in Jesus name I want to hear your amen over there it says, now the jaws shall lay by faith. But if any man, any woman, any believer draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we're not of them who draw back. Can I have an amen there? It says, we're not, we're not of them who draw back. Because those who draw back, they draw back unto perdition. But we're of them that believe to the saving of the soul. We'll keep on believing until the final day in Jesus' name. But persecution will come. Get ready for that. Persecution will come. Tribulation will come. Trials will come. It will, it will test your faith. Look at Acts of the Apostle, chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 22. It says, Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must through much tribulation. Not minor, much, major. May it says, much tribulation, much trial, much persecution enter into the kingdom of God. But remember, only 10 days, remember, it's negligible. Remember, it's for a brief time, a short time, we will make it. I said, we will make it. Second Timothy chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 12. Second Timothy chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 12 and verse 13. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There's no exception. All the men and the women, the boys and the girls, in your school persecution, your college persecution, in your family persecution, your community persecution, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus, the minister, the preacher, the pastor, the overseer, and the one, the steward of the kingdom of God, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Why? But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But in verse 14, continue. But continue. But continue. We'll continue in Jesus' name. And then in chapter 11, chapter 11, see what others have gone through of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 36. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 36. It says, and others are trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. It says they were stoned and they were sown asunder and they were tempted and they were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. That's what the others went through. We're not even going through as much as that, but even the little we're going through, we're going to overcome in Jesus' name. And then at the end of the prosecution, look, look at what he's going to do. First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5, and I'm reading here from verse 10. First Peter chapter 5, verse 7, I'm reading from verse 10. It says, but the God of all grace, 
who has called us unto his eternal glory. That's his calling, that's the purpose, and that's the end result. He's called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after that he have suffered a while. See that? A while. Only 10 days out of 365. A while. It is infinitesimal. It is small. It is brief. It's not for a long time. After you have suffered a while, compare the time of your suffering with, all, with the length of eternity. They'll mean nothing to you. It will make you perfect and establish and strengthen and settle you. It will settle you in Jesus' name. And so they went through all this, and, and, uh, but they remained unwavering in their loyalty. They remained unwavering in their loyalty. And they retained uncompromising faithfulness in the persecution. And they gave a divided devotion unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Persecution, yes, but then be unwavering. Persecution, yes, but be uncompromising. Persecution, yes, but be undivided in your loyalty and devotion. Uh, opposition to emperor worship uh, brought uh, all the persecution, but they kept on. They said, do what you may. We're not going to surrender our souls to the emperor worship of Caesar. They refused association with the pagan Jews that became the synagogue of Satan. And they retained their love for God and the grace of God in their lives and the holiness of life and the sanctification experience they got. They will not play with it and they retained their spiritual power unto the very end. The way they remain committed, you will be committed like that in Jesus' name. I'm coming now to point number three. The promise of Christ to the fearless and the faithful. The promise of Christ to the fearless and the faithful. It tells us in Revelation chapter 2, reading from verses 10 and 11. Revelation chapter 2, reading from verses 10 and 11. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Now, some people do not understand. They say, but I'm normally fearful. I'm a timid person. Well, in your strength, in your own self, in your own strength, in your own ability, maybe that's your natural situation. Why don't you cross the line and come to the supernatural and remember that the everlasting arms of the Lord are under you. And the everlasting strength of the Lord, they are under you. Remember that the promises of God that cannot fail, they are under you. Remember that Jesus Christ will never leave you, will never forsake you. He has gone through the veil of death already and he rose again in mighty power. And that one that is the lasting one is deity. That one that is the living one is humanity. That one that is the loving one is, uh, is, uh, is sympathy. He says, I am with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And remember, Remember, the spirit of the living God is the spirit of holiness and spirit of courage. He is by you all the time. He will never leave you. And when the triune God is with you, the Father is with you, the Son is with you, and the Holy Ghost is with you, there is nothing to fear. I said there is nothing to fear. Moses did not fear the power of Pharaoh. There's nothing to fear. And Daniel did not fear the lion's den. There's nothing to fear. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not fear the fire of Nebuchadnezzar. There is nothing to fear. And the disciples in the early church, they did not fear the power and the imprisonment of the Sanhedrin. There is nothing to fear. You will not fear in Jesus' name. He has given us a work to do and this work will be done. We're going to saturate this nation with the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. I said we're saturating this nation with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The fire of Nebuchadnezzar may burn. We're going to go through that. We're going to plant churches. We're going to evangelize. We're going to do everything he has called us to do in Jesus name. There may be not just one lion, not just two lions. There may be a den of lions on the way. We will go through that and do the will of God in Jesus name. A Sanhedrin of 7071, uh, vocal opposers of the gospel may be sitting in conspiracy, but in spite of them, they will be forgotten and then we will go forth and do the work of the Lord in Jesus' name. You will not fear. I said you will not fear. And the power of the everlasting God will be with you forever and ever in Jesus' name. 
fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you, not everybody, some of you, not everybody, some of you, into prison that she may be tried, and ye shall have trial, tribulation, persecution, suffering, ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. That crown of life, you will not miss it in Jesus' name. He that has an ear to hear, he that has an ear to hear anybody here today, he that has an ear to hear anybody here today, he that has an ear to anybody there today, you will hear. I said you will hear. You are the one that will conquer the devil. You are the one that will, con that will convert souls into the kingdom. And this work of the Lord will prosper in your hand in Jesus' name. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcometh, thank God I am an overcomer. In the day I am an overcomer. In the night I am an overcomer. In the market where they say except you pay, except you put your pinch of incense into the fire, so as to burn incense unto Caesar, you will not sell here, you will not offer to any idol. I said you will not offer to any idol. And yet God will not fail you. You'll be the head, you will not be the tail. You'll be above and you'll not be beneath in Jesus' name. And when all those people that are offering incense to idols, when they are forgotten, you'll be in everlasting remembrance in Jesus' name. It says, he that overcometh, thank God in the village I overcome. In the city, I overcome. On the way, I overcome. In my employment, I overcome. In my family, I overcome. Anywhere I go, anywhere you find me, I will be an overcomer. Am I talking about somebody there? I said you'll be an overcomer in Jesus' name. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. He's saying that the greatest evil that can happen, the greatest calamity that can happen is the second death when all those people are going to be cast into the lake of fire. It says, for you, God forbid. It says, for you, God forbid, that you will not go through that second death in Jesus' name. You will be an overcomer. A life of overcoming, a life of ceaseless praise. Be this thy blessed portion throughout the coming days. The victory was purchased on Calvary's cross for thee. Sin shall not have dominion over you. The Son has set you free. And wouldst thou know the secret of constant victory to be an overcomer? Let in the overcomer. His name is Jesus, and he will conquer thee. And he will conquer everything that is conquerable in your life in Jesus' name. Thy broken spirit taking his sweet captivity shall glory in his triumph and share his victory. Though all through, though all thy, the path before thee, the, the, the host of darkness feel. Look to thy father's promise and claim the victory. Still, faith sees the heavenly legions where doubt sees not but the foes. And through the veil and through the very conflict, your life will be stronger in Jesus' name. Most time may grow the conflict as near as our king's return. And they alone can face it who this great lesson learn that from them God has nothing but to only unlash the door, admitting him who through them will conquer forevermore. Admit Jesus Christ in your heart, in your life, you will conquer forevermore in Jesus' name. God is building a church that will overcome. A church that will evangelize the whole world. The fire may be there. The flood may be there. This church militant will become the church triumphant in Jesus' name. Thank God I am part of that church. I said I'm part of that church. I said I'm part of that church. And the power of the Lord will hold you unto the very end in Jesus' name. 
why don't you stand up and tell the Lord that power will hold you that power will, you will not fail you will you cannot fail when the everlasting hands are underneath you and when Jesus Christ says I'll never leave you I'll never forsake you you will be with you you will stand you will stand you'll not worship a God father anywhere a God mother a God mommy anywhere your, your savior is the Lord your leader is the Lord your redeemer is the Lord and the Lord will be with you forever stay with the Lord stay with don't go back don't go back and just stay with the Lord and say Lord I am here I will serve you I am here the work you have appointed into my hands I will do this work successfully and nothing will take this work away from you and be part of the fearless church if you're a fearless Christian a fearless convert, a fearless disciple, a fearless minister, a fearless pastor, a fearless overseer, a fearless leader in the church of the living God. The persecution may be there, but you will triumph in the name of the Lord.